the fruit growing area there is at 70, uh, 6,800 feet. We had some uh, fruit plantings that were at 7,200 feet. And we call that area the ice box. Peaches, the bulk of our peach production area is in the Mesa County area. We have a couple of uh, packing sheds in Mesa County. Uh, Talbot Farms packs the bulk of the peaches there, although we have several other packing sheds as well. When I came in 1985, the state of Colorado had 10,500 acres of fruit total for all of the state, including all of these outlying areas, including up by Longmont area, uh, Loveland area, uh, with some of the stone fruits up there. Present uh, acreage as of 2002, 5,500 acres. We have lost 5,000 acres in that time. In 85, the largest fruit acreage was apple, 6,500 acres, followed by peach, 2,100 acres, followed by sweet cherries, tart cherries, and pears of around five, 600 acres. It's a supposedly a perpendicular V. We've had some major problems trying to maintain that. It appears to be on summer, or do you summer prune at all? Because you get these big sprouts. We do summer prune, but not as much this year as we sometimes do. This year, we, because of the freeze out, we left a lot more wood in the that tree. why you did? Okay, that's one way you did. Because that. of the freeze last November, this winter, last winter, we did not take near as much wood out of the trees as we normally would have. So it, it, the trees look a lot worse than they did before we were going into the other years. Partner in the facility here at First Fruits Orchards. This is an organic uh, fruit production area. And he does have apples, he has sweet cherries, peaches, nectarines, nectarines apricots, apricots, pears. Pears, yes. Uh, so just about everything. Just about everything you can grow in Colorado we grow except for grapes. We're not quite there yet on grapes. We're lagging behind everyone. So my brother and I operate this, this farm. It's a 300 acre uh, certified organic operation. We've been in business since about uh, 1976. At that point in time we weren't organic yet, but we transitioned over to organic in 1987. It was a real good move for us and we're still doing it that way. Uh, we're 100% committed. At times we'll take an orchard that's uh, conventionally operated and we'll convert it to uh, or an organic operation, but that's the only point in time we'll be uh, uh, not certified for that that period. This orchard used to be a, a, a Jonathan block of huge old trees, probably 80 to 100 years old, and very unproductive. We just had to pay our pickers an awesome amount of money just to get up in the tree and pick them because they were so, apples were small, the trees were big, and so we decided to take them out, which is a real, real kind of a hard thing to do because these trees were majestic. They had trunks like this and arms like this, and just beautiful old trees. But uh, they made beautiful firewood. And those varieties were Rainier, Lappins, Royaltons, Somerset, and I think that's it in this block. The problem that they found with the, uh, as probably all of you know, with the, with the uh, Gisela 7 was the uh, virus problems. The old guy who ran this orchard for years and had cherries said it's, it's, it had historically probably more cherry crops than anywhere else because it was cold and it delayed blooming. And, uh, well, since this had cherries for all those years, I mean, do you have replant problems or do you just rotate your orchard? We've never gone back into, oh, yeah. into yeah. cherries where cherries have been. Um, these these are the first ones. That was an experimental peach block there. We're going back stone fruit on top of stone fruit. <coughs> oh yeah, definitely. Once we can get them on the tree, we've got a ready market. In fact, we could probably, you know, fill all of our acreage with peaches and not have any problems selling them. So, and this apple block represents, you know, a small portion of what we do up here, mainly because we spray the daylights out of them every every uh, seven days, and some of it's furrow irrigation. You can imagine trying to get water on a, a block, get it dried out fast yeah. enough and you can get back in there and spray. Right. It's just, you fight it and then you get a rainstorm mixed in there, mess your schedule up, it's a fight all, all summer long. So. And as few 
pests that we have with stone fruits, it just doesn't make sense for us to raise apples. Yes. Replant site, we took the old trees out, came back in, we treated the ground in the fall previous to the planting year. We had a combination of different treatments that were in here. We had methyl iodide, chloropicrin is another treatment, um, and mevalone, which is a uh, combination of uh, no, terpene, terpene, terpene materials. Base, yeah. Turpenoid materials. As you look down in here, the bigger trees that you see in here almost invariably are either the chloropicrin at one pound or one and a half pounds per tree or the methyl iodide at one pound to one and a half pounds per tree. But that's an example of what Cytospora will do. It'll kill the tree, probably this tree will be gone next year. You can see there's some gum clear on down. You see the leaves are flagged already. Yeah, yep. uh, you see much oozing out? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Lots and lots of oozing at the top. So, big time problems for our industry here. Probably the biggest disease problem that the peach industry faces is Cytospora canker. Replant is another major problem. But regardless of what you do, if you treat everything, do it right with fumigation, you can still wind up with Cytospora. Let's have a guess. How many miles is it from here to the first San Juan Mound? Okay. Oh my gosh. Winner, say, winner, win something. I don't know what. Yeah. Twenty miles. I would say three hundred miles. No. There's um, no way. More? The Earth turns. <laughs>